All right, Charles Johnson. Let's do this. For sure. Energy. Something like that. How'd you come up with that name? Is it is it like a play on energy? Um, or is it just it's a energy? Few things, bro. I'm very. Because uh, you're big on energy. I'm big on. With an E. Yeah. Big on all that, man. It's like. Uh, when I was coming up with a nickname, I was like, man, I don't want nothing generic like Paul Smash. Jones. You want the hitman? You know what I'm saying? I, I, I was like, man, what's something that encompasses me? Yeah. And energy was a play on words. Right. But it was also, I'm big on key. I'm big on your energy. I'm big on all that Bruce Lee. I'm big on Yeah. who are you? Yeah. Hey, adjust your mic for me a little bit. Just bend it. Yeah. That, that, Does that, that work? That's much better. It catch, oh, man. Catch, catches your voice better. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I can totally dig it. I'm huge on energy, man. I'm I'm all into, you know, the law of attraction and energy yep. and vibrations and, like, what we're, like, what frequency are you operating on? Mm-hmm. And, like, I'm just, um, I, I audit the people around me very closely. I don't let too many people around me. Um, and I was just thinking about this. I'm going to actually probably make a post on this, but man, oh, now's a good that fucking time to talk about it since I've been sitting here ranting for the probably the past hour before we got on the fucking, the podcast. But like, dude, people need to fucking take audit of who they have around them. And one type of person that you don't want around you is that fucking person who is always talking about what they're going to do when they when they uh win the when when i when when i win the lottery i'm gonna this is how i'm going to spend the money oh man it's going to be so good they they start yeah. spending this imaginary money that they don't have and those type of people are cancerous because they don't want to work for it they just want they just want something given to them i realize like that well, type of person it's... who is perpetually there's 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 a spectrum right there's people yeah. who just play just to win but there's a habitual person like if you really talk to them they're always having this conversation every time there's a big one in a different form they're yeah. always talking to you about like oh man whenever you know it's only a buck to play you know whenever i do this just oh man i'm gonna do this i'm gonna set up all these people and they're just always telling you about all these plans that <laughs> they funny, have with this lotto man. money and and i my mom my mom that, that's i grew up with a person like this like yeah. that's my mom and she still does it i'm like all right mom well how about we just go out and like, like work our ass off and just go earn the money like yeah. why are we always trying to like bank on this fucking thing that we're we're going to win because then like that's the mentality of like you're you're waiting for something to happen to you right instead of actually going and doing it yourself instead of taking action and going and taking something you're fucking waiting for something to come to you and nothing comes to you you have to go fucking grab it so yeah for the listeners like if you have somebody like that love them from a distance i'm not saying you have to like kick people unless it's your mom well i mean yeah you know what i'm saying like no i'm not gonna cut my mom out of my life but like you know, it's just like you just have like fewer conversations about certain things. Question like so with your mom, it's 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 funny because um I mean our parents are something that's in our life for most people most of our lives. Or yeah. but even if they aren't, it still affects our lives. No matter whether you want it to or not, your parents. And but touching on that, like once you get to a certain age you see People are who they are. They're just people, right? Parents and, are just um, people. So, do you, ex- you? It's hard as a as a kid because I've been in that position with my mom and before, and it's like, do you accept this person for who they are, or do you try to change them, or do you try to influence them, or do you have to accept them who they are because you still have so many things pulling at you as an individual to try to get to the things that you're attaining, and you, it's hard trying to balance that and also balance loving your mom when you know yeah like well, you said energy levels and like yeah well i think the true definition uh, yeah i think the true definition of love is just like is unconventional like un- unconditional unconditional yeah. um acceptance right so sure. i mean i think if you're showing true love then you just like love that person like despite um like them doing things that you know maybe not be in line with like your personal sure. creed cuz like me and my mom live completely different lifestyles like mm-hmm. I, I i i would love for her to be like take better care of herself and but like she's just who she is especially our parents like they've been there for a long time so i think you just love them and let them be who they are but just understand that they're people too right and you know what i mean and this is you can you can probably extrapolate this and like apply it to any person in your life like that you care about right just love them 
we just love them from afar, right? I mean, it's not like when we're kids and we're around our parents every day, right? You have your life, they have their life. It's not like they can be as, they don't necessarily <laughs> have to be as heavy of an influence as, as you're older. Oh my goodness. I think the, um, I, I guess, I think the greatest gift that our parents can give us um, if we are willing to grow outside of life is the ability to, of understanding like anyone, but like if we can be people who want to grow. Yeah. Like for me, what I've taken is my ability to, I just, I guess I can speak for myself is my, I'm very understanding. Like, I don't know how to explain it more than that. Like I yeah. can try to put myself in anyone's shoes and understand. And I have a lot of forgiveness from that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like, I can try to understand that this person's position because of my situation, because of my life, my growing up, my parents. Yeah. From from grasshopper all the way up, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's important just to have that understanding, right? Just people are just people, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's not right yeah. or wrong. It's just some people are on your vibration and some aren't. Yeah. So, And I just think that um, for anybody who really wants to have any certain level of success, um, whatever that means to them, like – the type of success like that you know, that we talk about, um, mm -hmm. like you have to have a certain caliber of person around you and you have to upgrade the people and you always have to be taking audit. So I was just thinking like, you know, the, the type of person that doesn't want to work for something that's just always, you know, hoping and dreaming and just waiting for that big payday. Like that's not the type of person that you want around you because no. they're, they're never going to put in the work, right? Man, dude, it's... And the work is what, dude, the work is fucking what makes it. Yeah. The work. That's it. You got to put in the work. For sure. Yeah, bro. I feel that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, I'm so excited. Like, I got so much I want to talk about, but talk we're not going to get it all in today, but. That's all right. Um, so what makes you so yeah. understanding? Because that's what you just said, like, you're super understanding of people. Where do you think that comes from? Pain. Pain? What pain is that? I'm big on pain, like. What do you mean? Um, Just everybody experiences pain in their life, and it's not like. Oh, you was you soft, you know. What I'm saying? It's just um, forms of pain like that yeah. change people, that affect them. I think pain is the thing that affects people the most. I made a post about this a, a few days ago on Facebook, and um, and I was saying, you know, like pain it creates, it it just creates a domino effect. Yeah, you know, and you can choose to handle that this way or that way, but the derivative of a lot of Things you're gonna do in life probably comes from pain, especially as a minority, especially as a black man, especially as, you know, like many different reasons. But pain and and like I said, it starts from when you're a child. Yeah. Now, it's confrontation. My lady, growth. my lady can get into it more. The psychological, psychoanalytical. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we talked about um, that on the podcast. I think. You know, she knows all the psychologists and stuff and the ids and all that stuff that goes into that yeah and we have those conversations but um your childhood plays a lot into who you are as an individual yeah but i wonder for how long right like at what point do you have like uh the wherewithal to make better choices just to make other choices to to rewire your brain right because we all have that ability to rewire your brain to mm -hmm. do different things a lot of people do it through like meditation or psychedelics or just just finding a new outlet and a new way to express themselves that's truer to themselves or whatever the, you know, mm -hmm. the case may be so like at what point do people take like self-responsibility and be like you know what i did have a fucked up childhood but i'm gonna do better right yeah huh yeah man so what um you're you're a track star something like that <laughs> what i, I want to know your story because i don't really know it that well like we've had a few conversations at the gym yeah um but like so are you free? i know you're, you're like you're a military brat right i don't know if that's probably the best term uh, for that. not necessarily um yeah no um the, yeah, are you? F I guess. How, I mean, <laughs> I mean, were you moving around as a kid or like yeah, both, both your parents are in the military? Way deeper right? than that, no, no. Um, my mom is white. My dad's black, and but my mom didn't raise me. She raised me until I was four, and then I went to live with my dad and my stepmom, who actually raised me oh, from okay. the age of four and a half, five, all the way to now, and um. Yeah, my mom's been like, you know, they say Papa is a Rolling Stone. Like, that's my mom. She's oh, yeah. just a free spirited, you and know. Gypsy. Um, Yeah, and she's here and there, you know. And so when I was younger, from the time I was in 
born until about four and a half, five years old, I would be anywhere. Like, she'll call my dad and, hey, we're in Ohio. He's like, what are you guys doing in Ohio? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, um, my mom was just moving a lot, you yeah. know? And um, I was on medication for ADD. I was, um, I can remember many days just sitting on the carpet and reading the Atlas and watching days of our lives bro like really literally i remember vividly you know what i'm saying and, yeah um, it, it's funny she tells a story of when i went to the doctor and i could t- explain to them and spell what precipitation was <laughs> at the age of four yeah because you- um you know um with that adderall and and with the add medicine if you're up it's, it forces you to focus yeah so you're just reading encyclopedias. so i'm reading encyclopedias i'm reading Stuff I have no business reading and just soaking all that in, right? And um, I'm at the age where I'm very influenced. Everything's influencing me, right? So, oh, yeah. Um, by the time I came to live with my dad, you know, from being on, having a lot of time on my own because my mom's in and out, you know. and um, I'm spending time with my grandma. When I was with my mom, I was spending time between my grandma's house who I love dearly, and um, my aunts and uncles that I don't know really now. Um, but and this was in Kansas. Okay. So. Where were you born at? I was born in uh, Topeka, Kansas. Okay. So I know keep, I look keep, away like. Uh, keep that on the DL. <laughs> yeah. Kansas sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no offense to anybody in Yeah, Kansas. but um, yeah, I did a lot of bouncing around as a kid, and it was really rough. And I didn't have any consistency until I came to live with my dad and my stepmom. No, was at the age of four? Four and a half, five. And yeah. um, my mom, uh, she got into some trouble, as she usually did. <laughs> and uh, I, my, she, she called my dad, and my dad, I'm coming to get him. And then from that moment when he came and got me, he had a conversation with my stepmom. My, mom, my stepmom was like, yeah, let's go get him. They came and picked me up um in kansas brought me back to st louis i was crying the whole way yeah a mess and then uh yeah that's most that's this ha- is this is where i've been <laughs> yeah dude, it's hard to be like separated from your mom for sure yeah like growing up i was like oh, i want to see my dad i want to be around my dad i want to see my dad but then when that moment happens you're like oh, what's going on you know what i'm saying that like, you don't you're yeah. a kid yeah well you just know that you want what's not there that's it and so uh i haven't seen my i have been with my dad a few times but i had like i didn't live with my dad so and all i knew was the come and go lifestyle with my mom and staying with my grandma yeah um who by the way was the greatest grandma ever but <laughs> um yeah man like that was that was my childhood and i had to grow up fast you know when i hit when i came that was i really think when i say pain like when i came to live with my dad and just that turmoil within a uh, broken home and uh but being allowed that consistency with my stepmom and her giving that yes and that nod like yeah let's go get them hands down i love her for, to death for that because yeah. you know like let's go get them like no if ands or but about it like get them out of that type of situation right yeah because you need structure yeah so that structure changed my whole life i, I have no idea where i would be today if that continue to happen yeah I, I i can guarantee i wouldn't be who i am right now why did i think your parents were in the military because my dad's a marine okay was a marine and my stepmom was a marine okay yeah see all right so i knew, I knew it wasn't crazy dude. so um <laughs> and so like i was off the chain when i came you know what i'm saying like i was like into everything i was like used to being independent i met my older sister who's a year older than me and um like we had battles she was a lot bigger than me and we like would go back and forth competed everything and then uh you know and then i would get in trouble constantly at school constantly with i was too smart for my own good um bored with school at the same time as like I was bouncing off the walls because they had me on all that medication, right? Yeah, do the ADD medication. Yeah. Fuck you up. They put that. They put my little brother on ADD medication when he was in like, I don't know, probably like first or second grade or something like that. Yeah. And um, he started like getting these ticks, like he would like blink all the mm-hmm. time. So then like my grandmother was all over. She's like, you got to get him off of that shit. Yeah. So then yeah, my, then my mom took him off of it. But man, that shit fucks kids up. Yeah. From the moment I came to live with my dad, he was like, no more medicine. We're just gonna whoop his ass. 
Yeah. Like, just old fashioned. Like, if he's, if we're gonna, work, we're gonna work with him. Like, try to understand him at first. But like, the, the, I was bad. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like after a while, I was just like, all right, we just need to get well, firm, yeah. firm and structure. And my stepmom was like, yeah, like when you came, I couldn't keep you on that medication. Like they, we tried it at first, like the very first beginning, but then like it was like. No, like you weren't the same person, and it's, it's like no. It's so hard on you kids, know, man. No, so. And the more I've learned that, um, so they like they just put kids on this medication, but a lot of times these kids are usually, um, probably not in every case. A lot of these kids are just like sleep deprived. Like mm-hmm. they don't get nearly enough sleep. Like they wake up too early for school. They're staying up too late watching TV. They get a lot yeah. of blue light. Like they're not getting proper rest. And when you don't get enough sleep. It can it can have like a shorter attention span, like you can't focus, and yeah. like all these different things that are attributed to ADD, which could just be like maybe you should get your kid like quality sleep. Yeah, which would come from like not having structure, right? You probably yeah. weren't getting good sleep. And I can remember like for years I would wake up. Um, I forget forget what it's called. Um, when you wake up and you can't move, I don't know. What that's sleep called. paralysis. Like sleep paralysis. Okay. Yeah, like wake up and like um like I'm up. But I can't move for years. I would, that would happen to me. What? Like up, I was, it's the scariest shit ever, yeah. bro. Like it's like an out of body, but you're in your body, and it's just like I feel like I'm yelling, like help me, help me, help me. But like I and can't. You're awake. You can't. I can't, I can't move. Like my body's still asleep. My but my brain's active. My eyes are like open, and I'm like. I used to sleep under a cover, or under a pillow. Like I always had to be under something to go to sleep. So when I would wake up. And I would be like face down or something. I would be so scared. Yeah. And like that happened to me for years. And I think eventually I like it hasn't happened to me for a very long time. Yeah. You know, knock on wood. But it does happen. I think that know, happened to me the other day, actually. Yeah. It's scary as shit, bro. Like yeah. I don't know. It's um, like your mind's awake and you're like you're like, oh like you're talking to yourself. Yeah. Like you wanna move, but you just can't move. Yeah. Like, are you really even fully like? Is that is that being sleep? Is it is that cognitive? Your your brain's oh, you're is it awake. Fully awake. Your body's just not like your body. Like something something went yeah, to sleep and something like, didn't. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's like you're not dreaming. You're here. Like I'm here. Like I'm. But I'm you can't fully talk. aware. Like I remember one time I woke up and my sister was up. She, she was up and moving, and I'm like trying to yell at her, and like I could feel myself start crying down my face because i can't move you know what i'm saying yeah it's scary shit but like some scary shit it's like in those scary dreams whenever like you're (laughs) running and running and running you can't run fast enough yeah it's like why am i running so slow or falling oh dude those just wake me up though yeah damn so So that was childhood yeah um and then so like let's dive back into it my sister was super competitive she was the super athlete when we were kids um she was we were just almost the same age. She was a year older, and when I got to high school, I was five two ninety eight pounds, and she was five eight one forty. You're a little dude. Yeah, so like she was always that much bigger than me throughout our whole life. She looks like we're three years apart, but she's only a year older than me. But like when we were nine years old, when she was nine years old, she won the national championship in the pentathlon. Oh yeah. And track, she was just a natural athlete, naturally good at. Everything that she did, she picked up the basketball. She was a lefty. Yeah, you know she was naturally good at everything. So, growing up, my sister was like the athlete, and I was just little CJ, right? Yeah. And I was not to say I wasn't trying my butt off and everything that I did. I was doing team sports, small, but I ran track for years. But I didn't really hit my my stride until I was about eleven years old when I had the ability. In track, you can't run anything over 800 meters until you're like eight, nine, right? So then you can run the 1500 meters at the age of like nine, ten, right? Which is three laps and 300 meters. Okay. So three laps and three quarters. And um, I told my dad, I was like, put me in the 1500. I knew I couldn't sprint with those dudes. I would try, but I never got hired in fourth place in a race. And I would go to every practice, work my butt off. And, you know, the first time I ran the 1500, I got a medal. For real? And I was like. So long distance. My dad was like, we found your race. Yeah. I mean, your body's built for it. And, man, like, I was always smaller than everyone. But, like, when I was 9, 10 years old, the main guy that I ran against, he was almost 6 feet tall. He ran for a Kirkwood track club. I can't remember his name. But this dude was super tall. And I ran against this other guy named Tyler Brock, very well-known track athlete and he was super tall as well and like 
I, these are the dudes I was competing with, and I would be on their hips, like, half their size almost, you know. But, yeah. like, when it got to those 1,500-meter races, nobody, like, I knew that I figured out that if I just keep working hard and I keep putting in the time, keep running, keep running, eventually I, those times keep dropping. I learned how to pace myself, and I just, me versus the clock. Yeah. yeah you know? So did you, like, when you got to high school, were, like, did your coach, like, work with you on, like, your running form and different things like that? or That's did, did all you... my dad. My dad coached me from the time I was younger. So my dad walked in a room one day, me and my sister, we were six, seven years old. He was like, you guys want to do track? He was like, yeah, what's track, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the next week we were out in U-City um, at their little wreck um, at Heeman Park, and uh Started running there, and then we started off practicing at Washu's track, and then we moved over to UCD High School when they redid the track there when mm-hmm. it was uh, probably 15 years ago. And, um, you know, I just it, – it, it's been a long transition with track. Like, track didn't naturally come to me like it did my sister. But by the time I finished, I was a two-time national champion and, and runner-up in the steeplechase. And I found my races, and I figured out how to – yeah, you know, dude. work through everything. That's legit. But my dad worked on me constantly because I was smaller than everyone. He was, open your stride. This is the mark you need to hit. And yeah. he had to become more knowledgeable. He ran track. He went to Huron and he and he ran in um the Marines and everything. And he talks tells us my dad has a story for everything. He grew up in uh the DMV area, DC, Maryland, Virginia. Um, he went to TC William High School, which is remember the Titans. Oh, for real. And um. And he wasn't there during the time of that film, but same, you know, he yeah. can tell you stories. He has a story for everything. So, like, um, when we started running track, he had some knowledge of track, but not as much as he has now. Like, now he has a wealth of it. He has all types of Well, yeah, I mean, just decades of just, Man, like, like know, plus studying. when he does it, he's all in, right? So, he's that's one thing I can get from him. Like, he's all in with that coaching, and he yeah. taught me how to be a better coach, taught me how to be a better athlete, yeah. you know, from watching him. Yeah, well, whatever the endeavor, you know what I mean? Just you have to go all in, essentially, you know what I mean? Especially in a competitive space, because if you're not, then there are people who will, and you will lose. Yep. Yep, yep. Did so, you win state or anything in, in high school? Never won. Well, we we won as a team, but yeah. I never won as an individual. Oh yeah. Um, I won conference almost every year in the mile and two mile from my sophomore through my senior year, and then districts and sectionals. I would always place very high. Um, high school track was always harder for me for some reason. I guess because people were older, and it was harder than summer track because you run against people your age, you hmm. know. And then high school track, you're running against people two, three years older than you. Um, and then my senior year of high school, I was I ran cross country, and I played football at the same time. And we won state in football that year as well. Mike Jones was our head coach at Hazelwood East in 2009. And I ran cross country, so I would literally get out of high school, out of class, 245, go run four and a half, five miles, come back. It's around 415, throw on my practice stuff for – football be at the football field by 4 20 practice there until 5 36 o'clock go home go to track practice out of u city damn dude <laughs> that was that was literally yeah i always wondered life. how how kids do two sports in the same season yeah. like it almost doesn't even make sense like i there was no way playing football in jefferson city like whenever i was in high school we could have done another sport like just there's it there wouldn't have worked like you had no time you have to be a special athlete and you have to it worked because cross country is such an individual sport. Yeah, and it's it's it, it, it's an individual sport. So I could get my miles in, and I can make it to time and practicing time. And I had something worked out with the coaches where, as long as I got there by that time, I'm there by individual drills, team practice. Because the beginning practice was usually like individual drills, warms up, warm ups for football. Which, and I'm running, so like I don't need to do that, right? Yeah, so there's no like, way my football by the time I get there. Up. So by the time I get there, when we were, Hazelwood East is very well known. Like we have a lot of people going to the NFL. It's yeah. like very rich football program. And um, at that time, I knew the coaches, and they were comfortable. I wasn't a starter or or even second string. I was like third string. We had a very good football team. Like yeah. I said, we won state, but um, 
I was competitive and I knew mm-hmm. I understood football from being around my dad all my life. So yeah. they, they allowed Dude, it. Kids do it all the time and yeah. there are a lot of different programs. I just know like the program I grew up in, which it wasn't the best fucking program. They they almost took it they would almost hinder kids' future success just because they were so worried about like today, if that makes sense. Like they didn't care if kids really went to college. Like they had me playing like whenever I was in high school, like center. Like and like, I played every position on the on the offensive line. And like they, I was a linebacker, and they moved me to like D end at one because they whatever they needed, they didn't care about me, they didn't care about my potential, like going mm-hmm. to college or doing anything like that. They only yeah. cared about them and their program. Okay, in which that head coach ended up getting fired, and they brought in a head coach who actually cares about their students. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, man. So whenever I like I hear of because there are a lot of kids who do that, like they'll play, um, I don't know, fucking they'll play like uh, like like baseball and track in the same. Yeah, it's season. very hard to do that one because people get hurt playing baseball often. Well, I just, I mean, just for, I just think about going all in on a sport. Mm-hmm. I just don't know how I would have the time to do both. Yeah, it's it's very. I mean, like football is seven days a week. Yeah, it's like literally, like, but cross country is just getting your mileage in. Yeah, so no, if you can, if you're doing if your it body can handle like it, that, if yeah. your body can handle it, I was I was only did it for cross country season because my sophomore year I swam and did cross country at the same time. Yeah. So I would go, I would uh, run, and then I would go to swimming practice. Yeah. And that was very helpful with my development, with my lungs and my breathing, and taught me how to breathe and how it got stronger, really. 100%, man. You know, and... Um, the load is definitely doable. Yeah. it's it's It only works with certain things, though. Like, I, I would never be able to do another sport and wrestle. Right. Yeah, I was like, just thinking that. Like During you, the winter season, it's basketball no and wrestling. There's no, Choose one. Yeah. And I played basketball all the way up to seventh grade. In eighth grade, but when I got to eighth grade, I tried out wrestling, and I was like, oh, "This individual sport, I can rock with this." And then when I got to high school, I was like, "I'm playing varsity every sport." And it was like, "You got to play freshman basketball." Nope, I'm going to wrestle, and I was on wrestling. I was on varsity by the time the middle of the season hit. Nice. You know? So you wrestled all through high school? Yeah, I made it to state every year except for my freshman year. I missed it by one match, and I placed one year my senior year. That's legit. Yeah, so I was I, I loved my wrestling journey. I'm very proud of myself for what I was able to accomplish. My wrestling state, I was super proud of myself for getting fifth because I wrestled two state champions at state, lost to them on points, and yeah. I beat the guy that I lost to at sectionals for oh, yeah. my medal. So I was like, yeah, I got fifth. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like I'm proud of my. my you got on the podium, dude. Yeah. Some some kids don't even make a it. A lot don't. Yeah, yeah. I have a problem with um, like downplaying shit or like like we were talking earlier, like expecting to win. Like, and I don't like celebrate victories or anything like that. Like, I've I've just always expected to do well. Mm. So like, I was really mad at myself. Like, I took third my senior year. And, like, I was expecting to be in the finals. Like, I was ranked number two. Deron Wynn was like, like ranked number Deron one. Wynn, yeah. yeah, fucking. I remember him. Yeah. One of the best wrestlers like in the in the yep. nation. Who was he? Liberty. Yeah, he went to Liberty yeah. at that time. And yep, then I remember. He, he fights in the UFC now. Yep, he's, he she trains in Arizona at AK. But. uh yeah, dude, but I was just like, ah, oh, man, like, a lot of people would be very happy with third, and I'm just like, I am I still, I'm just like, whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, and then, like, even then, like, whenever I was in high school, I thought about it, like, how many kids would be happy just, like, going to state, and, like, yeah. that was a given. Like, there was no issue, like, yeah, of course, I'm going to state. Like, I pinned my way through finals, like, through yeah. districts. Everybody got pinned in the first period. Yeah. Like, of course I'm going to state. Like, that was my mindset. Yeah. So it's like... It's a different mindset when you've been wrestling a lot of your life. How long did you wrestle? I started as a freshman. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you were pretty special then. You know? I mean, like, not special yeah, enough. I mean, <laughs> I didn't win still, that like, Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, but... Yeah, dude, so it's just like... Um, yeah, I don't know. I always just have like this this mentality of like expecting yeah. to do well. Yeah, and, and this is and conversation and because I of that. I downplay shit. This is <laughs> it's funny because me and um, Brittany Cloudy have had this conversation: unrealistic expectations that we kind of, when we are very competitive, we put higher expectations than are realistic. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes it's a good thing, but sometimes it's not. You know, in and, context, and right? You you almost yeah. have to though, right? You have to have like unreasonable goals because if you don't, you're just going to be mediocre, right? Yes. I mean, if you don't have unreasonable goals, if you're not talking to people about your goals and they're just like, okay, like like they're almost laughing at you or like they don't think you can do it, like then what the fuck are you doing? Like I have I have a hard time talking to people about what I'm doing and the things that 
I'm doing or like what I have planned because it's like they just you start talking to them and they almost get like glossy eyed because you can just see like they don't fucking know like and they can't see it and they don't believe it. Yeah. Like when I started this podcast, like I, there's a big difference now with the response that I get with people coming on the podcast like because in the beginning when i had like no episodes it's yep. like it's like i'm just like i'm reaching out and i'm talking to like, people anybody like, what I'm doing. come on let's yeah go. right and yeah. it's like it, it, it's like well i knew who like i wanted to talk to it still was like it wasn't like just anybody but it was like it was it was harder to get those yeah. yeses but now like i sit down with people it's like yo dude like i just like this is episode 76 like yes like i'm i'm almost to 100 now like i'm not even a year in so, so it's what just like talking about like consistency I'm fucking, right? like i'm serious and people see that right and then mm-hmm. um like yeah i don't know people come back around right i mean there's definitely people who have like reached out like i like i've invited before and like they'll reach out like way later yep. it's like yeah man like consistency i'm doing my damn thing yep (laughs) but you're consistent when people see consistency they want to be attached to people have a yearning to attach to people who (laughs) um consistency carries a lot of things man like yeah it's it's a lot of power in it and it's a lot of power in like being about what you say you're gonna do and people want to be around someone who is being successful and yeah and when people see success they want to attach to it even if they are not in a position to be attached to it yeah and so you'll see people who initially who and and it's the inc- inconsistent people who will say no nah, i'm good because they know what they are but once you start getting some success then they want to be attached to that success so you'll see them start hey when are you free again and yeah but it's like yeah dude i mean consistency is key like you have to have that but the funny thing is like it's like success like i mean that can be anything for anybody but like um it's it's like this perceived thing right like people view you as successful like even though like you may not view yourself as successful Mm -hmm. you know what i mean like (sighs) people would say that you're successful yeah right but i am not but you, <laughs> I people would say that I'm successful, but me because of my expectation, yeah, my ego and my expectation and my hubris, I would see I'm not as I'm not I'm not anywhere near no. successful. Well, like you know? when like you probably get it all the time, right? When people talk about fighting, like oh, dude, congratulations, like or like they talk about like how awesome you're doing or different things like that. But it's just like, bro, like I'm not even like anywhere like where I'm trying to be at. But like because you're in it. But to them, like you're just so successful. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's yeah. like, bro, like I still like I even talk to people about like fighting now, and like well, I don't talk to them about, it, but like I'll say like yeah, I used to fight or whatnot, and like. Yeah, like it can be like a big deal for some, like for some people, like just the fact that you fought, or like for some other people, it's like, oh yeah, like you fought on Bellator, or like, oh yeah, like you fought on the UFC. But it's like, all right, well, I never reached my goals, so like I never feel successful. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. But at what point do we realign our goals? Yeah. Like, what, what point do we realign our vision? No, Bella. Yeah, dude. And also, it's like, what, what level, like, what. And success is so relative. It is what it is. You, she doesn't need to go out. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, real. It, it's it's all relative, right? Because success can be anything. But um, I think to average people that like they have very they have very low standards of success, right? And then like whenever you're trying to be at that next level like then you have a whole different level of success right and if you want to reach that next level like that's where the consistency comes in right like that's where your circle comes in like that's where all these standards come in when you're in it when you're really in in and i call it your zen when you're really in it your energy yeah right you when you're really in it and you're in that then you have no like filter for mediocrity you have no filter for bullshit yeah like when it's around you you really want to you detach from it it makes you frustrated it gets you 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 can feel that like me i'm i don't know i'm i'm i don't know i'm 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 introverted you know Mm -hmm. but in a way i'm extroverted like i can have a conversation with anyone you know but (laughs) she's silly yeah, for the listeners, my girlfriend's dog here. <laughs> can't help you. I can't help you. I'm listening. But you, but you're you know, introverted. Yeah, oh. man. Like, 
in a in a way like I I my favorite one of my favorite people on the earth is my dog. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's like like I just like I like real shit. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like I, I if you're not coming off as if it doesn't come off as real and honest and like I can feel that. I can feel it. Like, yeah. Uh, like Do you think that um that's just like a part of it's like that it's like that um it's like the journey of greatness. It's like it's the fucking like you have to do it with people, but it's a very lonely journey. You know what I'm saying? Like it can be. It's like it's like that Ronin journey. Mm-hmm. Fucking there's a lot of lonely nights. Like you know what I mean? Like average people, like they're they're going out on the weekends, they're going out at night and they're drinking. But it's like the person who's striving <laughs> for more, like they're at home by themselves, like reading or working or like I spend a lot of time by myself. <laughs> yeah. When when you're a college athlete and. I was a division one athlete and like you have many nights like that. Like you can go out or you can think about like, uh, let me get some rest. Cause I'm getting up at four 30 in the morning and run 11 miles. Yeah. You say you're a two time national champion. Yeah. Dude. That's intense. Yeah. Fucking there. But that was in junior Olympics. That was pre college. Okay. Right. Oh, in college, in college, I, I, I mean, I got on the school record board for the steeplechase. At in the Division One school, that's at CMO Southeast Missouri, but um, yeah, and I and I, that was my biggest accomplishment because I had been out of school for a year, and then I got back into school. I like I didn't run for a whole year. And oh, I got yeah? back into school for two years, and that was like huge for me. That's the time, around the time I met um, Brittany Cloudy, and uh, it just like changed a lot. A lot of things changed for me. Um, yeah, why did you take? Why were you off for a year? It's a long story. Man. Oh, the, that's what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I when I graduated high school, I went to an HBCU. I was big on like I want to go to a historically black college. That's what HBCU stands for, okay. historically black college and university. And um, where'd you go? I went to University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Who did not have a track? Why didn't you go like Lincoln? And, um, Cause I didn't want to be in St. Louis anymore. Like it's I've Jeff been, City. I've been trying to get away from St. Louis and this and this Midwest Missouri. for a long time. I get it. And like I was like, man, I just want to get as far away as possible that can take me. And you then went to Arkansas. They they <laughs> Negro. I would have went. I, I went to, to Arkansas five love. But you know what's great? City Little Rock, Arkansas was about forty five minutes away. That place and, sucks. But it was cool though, because <laughs> it wasn't here. You know, for me at the time. I get so, it. Like. I don't know, man. Um, they offered me a full scholarship in cross country and track. The guy came out to one of my meets in high school, and uh, Coach Curtis Pittman, um, the, he was the head coach at the time, and um, he recruited predominantly Africans, Nigerians, Euro- um, Ethiopians. My teammates, like were, real Africans. My teammates were Ethiopian, Ugandan, and Nigerian. Like literally, I had one American teammate. For real? Yes. And you and his name guy. was Dexter. <laughs> <laughs> army army kid. He was there. For, he ran in the ROTC, so he he wasn't really an athlete, but he came out. He worked his butt off, right? Yeah. Uh, respect the mess out of him. And um, but like uh, yeah, my my that that guy came. He saw me at a conference cross country meet. He said, "Yeah, man, I want to give you a full scholarship to University of Arkansas Pine Bluff." It was huge for me. Like to be as successful as I was in amateurs and junior olympics and everything i didn't get many i got a lot of letters but i didn't get many full full ride scholarships and that was a big thing coming out of my household like you don't really have the money to pay for school and you don't want to get in debt and so let's full scholarship we've been doing this for how long and you you do achieved all this stuff for what so your school can be paid for yeah so i was like all right i guess i'll go here and so i went to uapb um, we didn't have an outdoor track. We ran during the winter time on the basketball court. Rough. And yeah, that um, sucks. we would go to the high school track, which kind of ate up at the time, the high school that we ran at. And he would take us out to the golf course during cross country season, which was fine. That was good on our feet uh, and everything. But it was, it was, it was tough, but you made what you could out of it. And which I did. We ran around a fisheries. We ran, yeah. it was cool. It was an agricultural school. Yeah. So, um, it was, it was cool in a way. It was different. Yeah. It was, so and I was, for a year? 
I was there for two years. Two years. Um, the first year, I got all conference. I got seventh at the conference meet. I got all conference as a freshman, which hadn't been done. Um, and we won. And it seems like everywhere I go, we win championships, right? We won cross country. We won the team title, which hadn't happened in years at that school, like over twenty years. So or ever, I don't know. So um, yeah, that was big. And then um. So after my freshman year, my freshman year, I take biological science twice and fail it. It was worth three credit hours. Oh. I come back home to St. Louis. I run through the summer, work my butt off. I'm in excellent shape. I'm feeling amazing, better than I ever have, running more miles than I ever have every day. I get back. I could have, my mom worked for Harris Stowe for almost for 20 years, 19 years. So I could have took a co- uh, course at uh, just a summer school class at Harris Stowe for no money, like just because my mom worked there. She worked in career services. I didn't. I just came home. I ran. I didn't think anything of school. I yeah. get back to school. It's the first week, and my coach says, Charles, do you know what's going on with, with your with your credits or whatever thing? You, uh, you're you're, um, you you're telling me that you're not eligible. Um. I'm like, what? I'm like, what? what? You need to go over to, uh, to the athletic office to find out what's going on. First week of practice. Man. I, like, when I heard, found out that I could not run, that was like one of the biggest, most disappointing things ever for me because I was like, man, I, I just felt like I let down everyone, like the world, you know? It's like, everybody expects so much of me, you know what I'm saying? And, yeah. Uh, so I lost my scholarship. I lost the. And I, I was staying in a, a dorm at the time. I had to switch over my dorms. Um, I had to get a job just to pay for school, finish up, because losing my scholarship, I lost everything. Why don't like, you just leave? You know? And because um, in my mind, I'll pass these classes, take these credits, and pull out some loans, and next semester I'll be eligible okay. for track season. So it didn't work out that way. I was still short going into second semester, so I stayed. I had friends that I hung out with every day from my freshman year, a core group of friends that I hung out with every day. And um, none of them did athletics or anything. It was just people that I met when I was there when I was a freshman, and, and like, we clicked, and we were this close, tight-knit group. And, uh, yeah, man, that was extremely disappointing. So when I came back home, after my sophomore year, I worked at J.C. Penney for my whole sophomore year just to pay off school, try not to be in debt yeah. too much. And I paid for all my classes. I paid for everything. I, I left with a 3.8. Yeah. And I came back home, and I was like, all right, now I can control my destiny. And I took another class at Harris Stowe. And the the plan was to get back into school that fall. I ended up not doing that. I ended yeah. up working at Walmart, trying to save up money yeah, further. Yeah, plans never work out. Yeah, save money f- further. And this is when I started fighting. Yeah. This is 2011. And um, never fought a day in my life. Had a fight, but never fought a day in my life. I just had wrestling in my lungs. Yeah. From all those years of running. And uh, Kim Porter was like, bro, you in town. Like, just come over here. I need. I mean, you know how to wrestle. I need somebody to work out with. Yeah, because he's bouncing around. So we we go to his mom's basement. <laughs> <laughs> he's got mats down there. He's got a bag. He, and he's got these old. He's probably damn near pro messed at up this time. gloves. Or was yeah. pro. He has like 30, 40 fights as an amateur, right? Yeah. And he was like, come on, man. Like, just uh, put these on and, like, I'm going to show you some stuff. And he, he, like, he shows me a triangle, he shows me an arm bar. And um, after two weeks of us training together, him showing me basic combination. I don't know how to throw my left hand for anything. I'm standing southpaw, trying to punch people with my right, and going straight, straight to faster. a takedown. Yeah. Right. Um, after two weeks, he's like, "Hey, I'm going up to Blue Corner with Ben Nogueira. Um, he needs a. It's a fight open. This guy just dropped out at 125. You, you want to fight this kid named Cody Trevino? Where's that show at? Is that in Kansas uh, that's City? That's Blue Corner. That's Kansas City. Yeah. Okay. The Harris. And uh, so I'm 20 years old, and uh, I'm like, yeah, man, fuck it, shit. I, let, me, let me ask my dad. Hold on. Let me let me talk to my dad about this a little bit. Uh, let me think about it. Like, give me an hour. I call him back 20 minutes later. I'm like, yeah, dude, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, like, you, I, I got faith in you, man. How nervous I, were you? Dude, I wasn't nervous until it was time to fight. Oh, yeah. You know, but after I started fighting, I wasn't nervous it anymore. Goes away. But um, he uh, – 
He was like, yeah, man, he's the number seven ranked dude over there. You don't have to take it if you don't want to. He's kind of been fighting for a little bit. He's like 4-0. and And I was like, This was I don't just care. boxing? No, it was a MMA, MMA fight. MMA, like, MMA. MMA fight. And I'm like, yeah, I don't care, man. Let's let's do it. We go in there. I take dude down in the first round early. He he hits me in my eye one good time. I'm like, fuck that. Take him down immediately. I throw a right hand as hard as I can and go straight to a takedown. Take him down. I ground and pound this dude, no lie, for a minute and a half. The ref is Bobby Volker. He ref my first fight. Oh, for real? Bobby Volker. <laughs> this is Bobby Volker, who just won the title for Shamrock. Yeah. And, uh, got a lot of brain damage in yeah, the Yeah, man. Uh, he's, he's refing the fight. And... Uh, Easy. I mean, he lets it go. I'm like not hitting the dude enough. Shocker. I'm not hitting the dude enough. Shocker. Bobby. I'm, not, I'm not hitting the dude enough. My arms get tired. But I'm just like on top of him, hitting him. And I'm in a position where like, I've never been in a fight and thrown as many punches a day in my life. So you don't think it should have been stopped? No, nah, I wouldn't hit him harder. I, like, I wouldn't hit him hard. Like and he it was, wasn't he was enough. Good. He was still just like this. Oh, but okay. it was just a, a controlling position where he couldn't. He didn't uh, know any wrestling. Yeah, you gassed out. And he was on his back. So yeah. he couldn't do anything. I was yeah, just full he mount. He had no jujitsu or anything. After that first round, I'm like, all right. KP's like, man, that's a good round, man. You did good. Like, like you, this dude got nothing on you. I'm like, you're right. <laughs> then we go out second round, do the same thing. Third round, same thing. I win that fight, you know, decision. I've been stuck with it ever since. Like, I was just hooked, man. I was like, I can dig it's it. nothing like it, you yeah, know? It's it's good nothing feeling. like it, man. I, it was amazing. So, what are those three minute rounds? It was two minutes. I think it's two minutes as amateur. Uh, three two minute rounds. Oh, it might be three minutes. No, it's three threes. threes. Three threes. So, like, I had never fought that long in my life. I was so tired. I was like, man, I don't even get tired. I was throwing boxes at Walmart at that time and running still. Yeah. And I was like, Man, I was so tired. I was strong. I was tired. It's exhausting, dude. Never got that tired in my life. And I was like, I was hooked. I don't like getting that tired. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. If something could push me, though, like, that's how I am. Like, if it pushes me, like, I'm like, all right, I got to figure this thing out. You know what I'm saying? Like, so that having that feeling of tiredness and, like, never – Running all these years of my life, I've never been that tired. Wrestling, I've never been that tired. Dude, it's different. It's like it's, I can push myself and make myself pretty tired and get kind of exhausted, but it's a different type of exhaustion that happens very fucking fast. Yep. When you're in extreme competition like grappling mm-hmm. or like fighting or even like jujitsu, it happens where your muscles burn out and they get filled with lactic acid really quickly, and then you're just done within like minutes. You yep. know what I mean? It's like it's not like – this the slow tiredness that would come yeah. from like I don't know, like walking all day or like going for like a long run or something. It's like this quick like you're done and then right. now you have nothing left right. and then everything's all like filled with blood and blown up and you can't yep. like move your <laughs> hands and like yeah that's exactly how I felt that fight but I still just took them down was on top of throwing as much as I could yeah you know, yeah and you're um, just trying to control them so yeah that was my introduction into MMA because. F- my dad always said everything happens for a reason, and I carried that moniker, you know. So like, everything happened for a reason. It was meant for me to, like, lose my scholarship, I guess, to find fighting, you know, like, cause I'm doing it to this day, and I'm yeah. very successful at it. And um, we didn't have the closest relationship, so during that time, I like got put out of the house when I was home and stuff, and I had to figure out what I was gonna do. And um, I've lived with Ken Porter for a while, and I was trying to get in, and then this this is the time that he was like, hey, I'm going to take you out to St. Charles MMA on Sundays. Like yeah. They spar and stuff, and you can go with some. They know what they're doing. They know jiu-jitsu. I was like, jiu-jitsu, cool. Like, I need to learn that. Like, I want to learn that some more. So uh, when I popped in, I was training with Josh Augustine, who was like 135 at the time, and Lucas Clay still in high school. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Those were my two main training partners when I went on Sundays. Mike would put me with them, and – um that was my introduction into like real MMA and I was like man these dudes are legit I remember seeing um Alp Oskalich and Joshua Sempo in the ring with this big guy with all these pads on and they just going at it and I'm like man those dudes are legit like yeah was this was this the Cave Springs gym yeah yeah it was a big uh, one too yeah and it was in a gymnastics gym with a high ceiling and it's just you go in there and it's just a bunch of blood, sweat, tears, and like hard work. Back door open, hot. Yeah. And it's like this is yeah. my speed. Like but, but I love this. That was yeah. a good gym. Yeah. That was a really good gym. Yeah, I love that gym, and um, that was my introduction into like real training. So um, 
after that bouncing around time, man, and um, I had a lot of things going on at that time. I was, like, basically homeless for three months. I would, like, sleep on the yeah. – some nights I would, like, stay in the parking garage. Some nights I would stay Shit, on dude. the Metrolink, and some nights I would – my cousin lived in – um. Off Brentwood, you know, where that Walmart is, that's yeah. the one I worked at. My cousin lived in a little cul-de-sac around there. So I would some nights I would be able to go there, but some nights I wouldn't. So I would have to figure out what I would do. Dang. It's so, so like, um, it was rough. It was a rough time. And then, like, Ken, Ken couldn't come always come get me. or Yeah, you were 20 at this time? Or, yeah. So it was, like, it was very rough. Um, And uh, it was, like, a three-month three, in, three month period. And um, my mom came from Kansas to St. Louis for that summer, and she lived with me until I figured out what I was going to do. Yeah. And then I got back on good terms with my parents and um, emailed the coach at SEMO within two weeks. He was like, we got this how much money we have, and this is what we can offer you. I emailed the coaches at SLU, and they were like, see if you can get financial aid. And I was like, I don't like them. Yeah. So <laughs> I, and that's how I ended up at SEMO because it just felt more home inviting and felt like they wanted me there. And Coach Ryan Lane, he was just like my type of guy. So, like, he uh, he was very inviting. And he was like, if you do what you're supposed to do, we'll give you more money. We'll we'll take care of you. I made all uh, conference and track day. And when, I, when track season rolls around in the steeplechase and they – pay for my books and everything my second year you know yeah. so they took care of me you know it was just a long journey and at the same time i'm, I'm taking judo yeah and, um even though i wasn't supposed to i was taking like judo they had a uh intramural judo class on okay. campus so i had this big a3 a4 uh judo gi <laughs> and i would go and I would learn, like I was learning pseudo gari, all that stuff, man. I like, I remember vividly, and the instructor loved me, and he was just very, but they were very traditional, and they, he, I luckily had a good instructor. Yeah. And um, Simo Judo Club, it's still on Facebook. <laughs> um, they're a good group of people, but um, yeah, man, I tried to keep myself active with fighting while I was still running there. So when I finally came back home, 2013, 2014. 2015, that's when it was. Um, it was just like full straight seat. MMA. Yeah, full like now I can just that. yeah, I can just and me and um, my lady at the time we just found an apartment. I was like, I don't care what I do as long as I get to MMA practice. I'll figure out working. Yeah, it took me like the summer to find a job, which was rough on her, but she, you know, we took care of each other. Yeah. You know? So like you knew like all that time like you're like. Those last couple of years of school, like, you knew, like, you were going into MMA. Like, that was the plan. Yeah, man, I made up my mind. I was like, man, it's it, – because when you look at track, man, track, it's – I just I, – I love influencers. There's not many influencers in track, but as a distance runner, it takes a lot of years before you become – there's there's a few prodigies, but, like, the most successful distance runners aren't successful until, like, years of running. And um, I was I wasn't prepared to do that much running on my body and like it's a lot of pounding and I just I was I was very intrigued with what would I have done had I wrestled out of high school and I was very intrigued with jujitsu like the mind game and mm -hmm. I watched Bruce Lee films growing up I watched all the fight films growing up I love Pernell Whitaker I loved you know um, Johnny Pep I mean Willie Pep. I love, like, all the action movies. So, like, I was always fascinated by fighting. I just didn't know how to fight. And then mm. when I learned how to fight, it was like, what's up? You know, like, <laughs> I can be me. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, track, I could be me. Everybody knew who I was in St. Louis and Midwest. You know, yeah. But, like, MMA, I really could be me. Like, I really can, like, this me. Like, express like, yourself. Yeah, like, in, in any form possibly. And I – and. And it all is the greatest thing is like it's all dictated on you. Like, what are you gonna put in? Just like that feeling I got from distance running. Just like the feeling I got from wrestling. What are you gonna do? Like you're you gonna of put the destiny. work in. Yeah, I'm big on like people's will. Like, like when you came up, I will. I told you I love it, bro. Yeah, like, that shit is legit. You know, like I'm big on like, what are you? Who are you? Your energy. Like that's why that became my nickname. Like. Who are you? What are you? You know, my favorite. I'm. I love uh, like Greek mythology and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like when I was a kid, I used to read it all the time. Like that story. So, 
my one of my favorite stories is Icarus. Yeah. You know, like people look at him like he defied his father, bro. I'm like that's what really like that's real like living. Like his hubris made him fly that high and you know, but people don't know the whole story of Icarus, you know what I'm saying? Well, tell the story for the listeners. We only know what we only know what like industrial the industrial mindset left out after the 1700s like it also said don't fly too low or the ocean and the water and the mist will weigh down your wings people only know don't fly too high yeah because so the sun will melt the wax so they're teaching right? everyone like to set a limit yeah it's like an industrial mindset you know like what do you mean industrial mindset like you got this whole um it's like just creating workers for like yeah, the, the system. Yeah, like the public schools. That's all public school was created for. Oh yeah, just just factory workers. Yeah, it's from factory mindset. Like I mean, that's why and, you set uh, this time and there's this time. Exactly. And you take but your public school was literally created from the factory owners and stuff. Shit. Yeah, like, it was like, the same was model. Like, exact model. Like and people like they're teaching people to settle and okay, you'll work this normal job for 50 years, you'll be able to get home, watch TV, and your day yeah. will be over. Yeah, and that's, well, and that's why, um, like, that's why home ownership is pushed so heavily, right? Because if you buy a home, then you're stuck at a place for so long, right? And then if you're stuck at a place for so long, then you're probably going to want to work at that place, which is usually a factory, right. right? So it's just this fucking this whole system that feeds itself. Yeah. yeah. Average. Yep, and then so, like, I'm big on I'd rather fly high and aim too high then be the average normal blows or below what my ceiling is like you know they say what's the worst thing in life wasted talent you know wasted creation like when you wake up in the morning we've been taught like people like the first thing they do is pick up their phone yeah first thing they do is like it's so many influences in the world right when you wake up in the morning, that's when you're most creative, man. Like, take a second to just breathe in the air, you know what I'm saying, and breathe in who you are. Yeah. Like, people don't even do that. People wake up and they're influenced by something. They wake up and they're straight to all this shit that we're influenced by. And when they, they don't even take a breath to breathe. Yeah, it's taking 30 minutes in the morning. That is when you're, uh, you're, you're you most creative. Like, I think you're in, like, that yeah. alpha state. And it's like people lost that. You know, like people, or they don't understand, or they don't know, or they're just in this. We're definitely in a time of constant stimulation. That's for sure. Not Everywhere. Yeah, there's always something grabbing for it's your scary. attention. We have these conversations, and it's 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 scary. It's only scary if you're not informed, though. Like we try to be. That's what I was telling her. I was like, um, fear comes from like not having enough information or understanding yeah like um or sometimes you just like make up shit in your head too yeah yeah no and it, and it's a lot of it is primitive like yeah, so your amygdala is like it creates like it gives you reasons like it's it's a reason it's there like genetically or um primitively or like you know what i'm saying that yeah. that that thing is there for a reason you know it's going to tell you but you have to be able to like heed to those things and like yeah i mean you gotta don't use be your, reactionary yeah you gotta use your greater thinking mind right i yeah. mean and like and like actually take things into account because like there's how many times have you have you been like worried about something and then like you just like face it and you're just like what the fuck was i worried That's, about that was a shit. like what was that like <laughs> why was i worried about that public but speaking we're one Huge. of the weirdest yeah we're one of the weirdest creatures like we live in this this state of like we we live in the past and like we're constantly in stress and, and like, fear and fear yeah right like, I mean there's that's a, why we have the president we have now well there's a book I think it was called like why don't zebras get ulcers and it was and there's more science about what was it. that about it's basically just talking about how zebras always live in the moment like so and I didn't read the book but like the analogy with the zebras is that so like a zebra gets chased by a lion like in that moment they're in fight or flight if they're if they're getting chased by like a lion or something mm-hmm. right but if they survive then they immediately return back to baseline and now they're just living their life they're not living in stress and fear of that lion that was just there right because Mm -hmm. they're not in that state anymore so i mean that's just kind of stemming off the idea that like stress causes ulcers which we found out isn't really the case 
but it's just the idea of like living in the present always and not living in the past because like when you're living in the past like you're suffering mm. yeah yeah that's i mean <laughs> you can't control the past man no you, you know and it puts you in a state of constant like reaction yeah it really does. You're, you're you're never you're reacting to everything. You're not you're not you're not in control of anything. You're yeah. reacting to everything and, and, and when people understand that, like they'll start understanding that uh, maybe I need to have the mindset to create, be ahead of the plan and understand it enough to where I'm creating rather than I'm reacting to everything around me. Stimulus like we say, energy around us. Yeah, man. You, you just know. gotta live intentionally. Indeed. Yeah, right Indeed. on. Well, brother, let's wrap this up, dude. We're, we're right at an hour. Um, I'm going to leave the floor to you. If there is any um, any sponsors you want to plug, anything coming up, um, obviously, like, spit your socials out so people can get a hold of you. I will uh, also tag those. Okay. Um, my uh, Instagram is Charles Johnson MMA 125 and my Facebook, just Charles Johnson. Twitter, Energy MMA. Do you do I Twitter? N-N-E-R-G. I'm trying to do better because literally that's the place where you make the most business, like, relationships. And I'm big on trying to network. So, yeah. Um, Twitter is huge. Like, it's very underutilized. Like, you can speak to anyone in the world on Twitter. Yeah. Almost. A lot of people like it. Yeah. And it's, it, if you're a business, you you definitely have to learn how to utilize Twitter. I would argue more businesses are actually on Instagram. Yeah. But um, sure. as far as like networking and um, Twitter, just like contact. Yeah. It's it's very underutilized. A lot of people like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. But yeah, those are those. And uh, just shout out to St. Charles MMA, you know. And, um, Man, we got a big year, a lot of big names, a lot of, lot of young talent there. So I'm excited for the future for that gym. Yeah, what's next for you? I know you just had a boxing match. Um, you going to take any more of those? Uh, yeah, I've been working with uh, my old coach who initially taught me how to box during that time that I was home when I started training with KP. He taught me for about three months before I went to school. And uh, so he's, he's trying to get me back in line with boxing. He's always told me, like, dude, you're a natural – it was like you're gonna be a champion at this. You're like this is what you should be doing. He just he feels that I will be more successful in boxing than MMA. Um, we'll see. Yeah. You know, but I've been been trying to give myself a chance at yeah. everything, and I'm just working. So I will tell. If I can get a get a fight, I'm gonna try to get a fight. You know, most likely, but really just work focus on the craft right now. Yeah. So creating and understanding. That's it right now. So I can dig it. I can yes, dig sir. It. Yes, sir. Shout out to I Will. <laughs> and Shout out to uh, my boy Adam Meredith. Shout out to Travis Perry, Powerful Blessed Champions. His brand, they're uh, sponsoring me now. Um, they're a really good group of young men trying to make a difference. Um, yeah. And um, Energy MMA, baby. Right on. Yes, sir. All right, buddy. All right. All right, everybody. Till next time.